Thank you very much. Uh, we are pleased to have our very own director, Leah Mervinga, uh, giving a, a talk on uh, Fermilab and uh, general impact on, on uh, field and society. So uh, Leah began her tenure as director of Fermi National Accelerator Lab in April of 2022. Uh, an internationally renowned accelerator physicist, uh, Leah previously led Fermi, Fermi Lab's Proton Improvement Plan uh, two project, an essential enhancement to Fermilab's accelerator complex that will provide powerful high intensity proton beams to enable the world's most intense neutrino beam uh, to the flagship long baseline neutrino facility and the deep underground neutrino experiment, or DUNE, uh, and drive a broad research program. So thank you, Leah, and whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you, Dylan, so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm truly delighted to see all of you here and to have those of you joining us via Zoom. Um, I want to start by, first of all, congratulating the graduates today and, uh, and thanking you, both the students and the parents, as well as our colleagues who make this happen. Saturday, first of all, Saturday Morning Physics has been going on for 40 consecutive years since the early 1980s without missing a single year, even during the pandemic. It started by Leon Lederman, the second laboratory director of this laboratory and also Nobel Prize laureate. And so it's been an inspiration, I hope for all of you, but for me personally as well. And that's why I am here today. But I wanted to thank and congratulate the graduates and point out that I, I'm always amazed that you could be sitting in your house, in your bed, playing computer games or doing something fun, and yet you're, you're here to listen to a lecture about physics. So this is a lot to me, and I appreciate it, and that's what brings me here as well. So thank you for that, and thank to the parents. So it is my pleasure today to, to describe um, the program to give a, a high-level overview of our laboratory's program as a whole. So t hopefully we can together gain an appreciation for what we have here in our backyard, this renowned national laboratory dedicated to particle physics using accelerators to do this uh, research. So, oops, uh, I need to click. Ah, thank you, Dylan. <laughs> Thank you. Now it's working. So Fermilab is our country's particle physics and accelerator laboratory. We operate the largest accelerator complex in the United States, second largest in the world after the CERN, which is located in Geneva, Switzerland. We have about 2,100 employees in our laboratory and a budget that's a little lower than a billion dollars. So we're doing big things. But more importantly, we have scientific users from around the world who come to use our facilities, our accelerators, our detectors, our experiments, our computing facilities, to do the research. And, and this is incredible. This is a big part of why national labs exist because they operate large user, scientific user facilities, that a single university cannot do that and make those facilities available to researchers from around the world. So you already know that there is an international element to, to what we do, to this enterprise. And as we move into, we were established in 1967. So as we move into the next 50 years, our mission remains to solve the mysteries of matter, energy, space, and time for the benefit of our society as well. So particle physics, as you might know by now, uh, studies the most fundamental constituents of matter and, and how they interact with each other, the fundamental interactions, which are four of them, the electromagnetic, the gravitational, and the strong and weak, two nuclear forces that bind the elements together. So in our 55 years of discovery, 
in our uh, and uh, of our illustrious history, I would say, we have made many discoveries using our accelerators, including we discovered right here at Fermilab two of three of the uh, elementary particles of the standard model of elementary physics, the top and the bottom quarks and the tau neutrinos. And together with our colleagues at CERN, we contributed significantly in the discovery of the Higgs boson, which took place in 2012 at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. And right now, the, our physics program is really, to a large extent, driven by strategic plans that the high energy physics community in the whole US puts together every roughly 10 years. The most recent one, the most recent report came out in December of last year. Uh, and these plans are called P5 plans, Particle Physics Project Prioritization Plan. The previous one, came out in 2014, and I was on the committee that helped to write it. So our laboratory executes what is this, what, what's in this plan, and there are large projects, and we'll talk about that. But the important point is the scientific drivers that drive the program that the committee puts together. So these scientific drivers, between the 2013 and the 14 and the 2024 P5 plans are very similar. And there is a little bit of difference. Let us walk through those. The first is the study of the Higgs boson. We discovered it in 2012, but now we need to study it in detail. We need to produce many of these particles and analyze their properties because they, they they hide a lot of, they can explain parts of the universe which we don't understand yet. The second driver is neutrinos, and this is what we focus on. Fermilab and the U.S. more broadly, whereas the Higgs is the European focus, we focus on understanding neutrinos. Neutrinos are everywhere around us, the most abundant particle in the universe, uh, second to the photons that carry light. Uh, they have mass, but their mass is so light, it's a million times smaller than the mass of the electron, which is already very light, so much that for many years, scientists thought that neutrinos had zero mass. And the fact that they have mass is, ve is a very intriguing fact and phenomenon. And although they're all over us, we understand very little about them because they are so light and because they, they, are, they have neutral charge, they're not uh, charged particles, neutrino, neutral, um, they basically traverse matter almost uninterrupted. And therefore, they interact very quickly with matter, and therefore, it's very hard to also detect them because they interact weakly. And therefore, we need to, to create very intense beam of neutrinos to create massive detectors and to come up with the best detector technology in order to maximize the likelihood to catch them and study them. We believe, as we'll see in a minute, that they hold big secrets of our universe. And that's why the entire U.S. high energy physics program is centered around the study of neutrinos with Fermilab as the lead laboratory, as we'll see in a minute. Another uh, scientific driver is dark matter. Um, this uh, we have not discovered yet. We have evidence it exists and that it comprises 96% of the matter in the universe. So another big mystery part of our program also studies dark matter. Another driver is dark energy and inflation. That, that has to do with how our universe expands. We do some study here, but we're not focused on this uh, part. And back in 2014, we called, the, we called the fifth driver exploring the unknown. The most recent P5 report called it search for direct evidence of new particles 
and pursue quantum imprints of new phenomena. I love this. This is what it means. Back shortly after the universe was born, when it was very, very tiny, it could be described by quantum phenomena because it was so tiny small. Between then and now, it's trillions of light years the u has, has grown. The universe has expanded to trillions of light years. And the, the, the imprints of this quantum phenomena that started when the universe was little are still in our universe today. And this scientific driver is to study those imprints of quantum phenomena in our universe today. This is magnificent. And these are all the scientific drivers that, that drive the field. And that's what effectively is our mission here at Fermilab. So how do we do that? Um, we use core capabilities. Those are formally defined by our Department of Energy, which funds the large majority of our research, by the way. I should say Fermilab is one of 17 DOE national laboratories. There are all 17. Our state has two of them, Argo National Lab and us, and, and altogether 17. So our core capabilities, things that we have real expertise, we have expert people, we have facilities, and, and we have capabilities in general, infrastructure, include, of course, accelerators and detectors, advanced computing, user facilities, and this is our accelerator complex. Um, particle physics, of course, and more recently, we were recognized uh, uh, for mechanical um, uh, engineering and systems engineering, microelectronics, and plasma and fusion energy, because we're very good at building magnets that are used for fusion energy. We don't do exactly fusion energy, but, but we do um, uh, magnets, for example, that are used. So let's now start, go, go down each one of our uh, scientific programs to talk about it, starting with neutrinos. So Fermilab is the lead laboratory, and we're building the Dune experiment. We're in the middle of constructing this experiment, Dune. Dune st stands for Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, to be the best in class neutrino experiment in the world driven by the long baseline neutrino facility, which has two sites, um, one at Fermilab and one 800 miles away in South Dakota, where, where in South Dakota there are detectors located one mile underground, one mile underground, and it's driven by a state-of-the-art particle accelerator, PIP2, which is under construction here at Fermilab right now. So, Dune is the experiment, LBNF is the facility, and PIP2 is the accelerator. The accelerator is going to produce proton beams that will be impinged on a target. They'll produce neutrinos. Those neutrinos will travel First of all, we'll detect them here at Fermilab, and then they'll travel 800 miles away under the mantle of the Earth, all, almost uninterrupted, and they'll end up one mile underground in South Dakota in a mine where we have massive detectors installed that are filled with the most state-of-the-art detector technology that consists of liquid argon detector technology, and there we'll study the interaction of neutrinos with liquid argon, and from the interaction, we'll study their properties. This whole enterprise is a multi-billion dollar enterprise. LBNF by itself, with two sides, is 3.3 billion, roughly. And the PIP2 accelerator is one billion, roughly. I'll show you some more numbers later. And in addition, we are working with international partners who contribute on the order of, an, of more than a billion dollars to this whole experiment. And we're in the middle of constructing this experiment. 
it is our laboratory's highest priority. We have an ongoing right now neutrino experimental program. We have a smaller, long baseline neutrino experiment that sends, we send neutrinos to Minnesota right now and study them. And we have a short baseline program with three detectors here at Fermilab. That are one is in commissioning and the other is in operation. The other finished data taking and they are analyzing the data. Our scientists. So neutrinos are us basically is is what I'm saying. But this is going to be the definitive neutrino experiment in the world, and that's how it's built because of the intensity of the proton beam because of the long baseline, unprecedented long baseline, 800 miles, and because of the massive detectors, uh, the, the kilotons of the liquid argon that are enclosed in the detectors in South Dakota. Why are we studying neutrinos? Maybe we can talk a little bit about the science. First of all, we believe that neutrinos um, uh, by studying them, we can unlock the question of why the universe is made of matter rather than antimatter. Th this really answers why we're even here, because we're made of matter. If, if matter and I, at, at equal zero, when the universe was born, equal amounts of matter and antimatter were created. But, but in the process, where did the antimatter go? Only matter survived. And, and that's why we're here. If both part, types of particles existed, they would annihilate each other, so we wouldn't exist. So by studying the way the neutrinos oscillate, we say, from here to South Dakota, that sheds light into the origin of matter in the universe. Another way to think about it that I like to think is the standard model of the particle physics that I showed you earlier a couple of slides ago, that is the Higgs and the other elementary particles, does not have a mechanism by which neutrinos get mass. The Higgs mechanism explains why all the other elementary particles get mass, but not for neutrinos. So. The experiment we'll be doing, the data from Dune, could really change the way the standard model of particle physics is written. That's, that, that's part of what we're saying here. Could rewrite the books of physics, in other words. So, in addition, neutrinos play a role in the cosmos. And by studying neutrinos, we can watch the formation of neutron stars and black holes in real time. And another uh, uh, scientific motivation is Einstein had dreamt that all four interactions at some energy scale converge and become one, which is a very audacious, if you like, hypothesis. Because imagine the nuclear force, force is so much stronger than gravitational force. So to think that they all become one is, is quite is very, is more than bold. We believe that um, with, with the Dune experiment, we have a possibility to observe proton decay if proton decays. Um, we have not observed that, and that could shed light into the unification of all the forces, which was Einstein's dream. So we really are addressing some fundamental questions, not on, only of neutrino science, of particle physics, of science as a whole, I would say. Okay, let's talk a little bit about where we are in the construction of this project. This is a three-dimensional layout of what's happening one mile underground in South Dakota where the, these huge detectors are going to be installed. Just sit and think for a minute. The, by the way, this thing in South Dakota it used to be a mine, a gold mine, as a matter of fact, that was repurposed to a physics laboratory. And so the, there is this uh, um, elevator. Um, it's more like a shaft or 
stage, right, that takes 10 minutes to go down one mile. And so what we had to do is, at this one mile, this is how the caverns look like one mile underground. There'll be two large caverns, the north, north and, and south, that will house detectors. Ultimately, in the in ultimately four of them, initially two, and there is a metal cavern which is for utilities. You can see the dimensions here. It's something truly unprecedented. And what we had to do is excavate these caverns from a mile underground to make to turn this into to turn the space there into a laboratory like this. It took. 800,000 tons of rock removed from a mile underground up to the surface and dumped at an open cut nearby in Leeds, South Dakota. And the excavation is complete now of this entire space as of February of this year. It took two, three years to get there. So we are thrilled that we checked this milestone for the project. And the Right now, we're in the process of using 6,500 cubic yards of concrete in order to pave now all of these areas before we start installing the detectors. 800,000 tons of rock moved from a mile underground to the surface and then dumped to make room for this huge experiment. Mind-boggling. Uh, so, the installation of the detectors is going to begin in 25. First components have started to arrive. I'll show you some pictures. And at the same time, you might have noticed as you come up on Kirk Road that construction at the Fermilab site has started already. There is going to be big construction here on our site because we need to house the near detector here. The detector that's going to characterize the neutrino beam shortly after its source, it's produced, and before it goes all the way to South Dakota. So we'll be able to compare neutrinos here and their properties with neutrinos in South Dakota and have two measurements almost simultaneously. So take a look when you leave. It's a, you can see the construction on Kirk Road. More to come uh, early next year for real construction. And this is a photograph of the um, caverns, the, fin the, the, the complete, completed excavation in South Dakota, and this is the picture of a person. So it, it, is, it is awesome. And more pictures of the north and the south cavern, and, as, uh, and so on. Now, the detectors themselves, is, they are truly international endeavors. And they, are, and they are a model of international partnership. There are two of them, as I mentioned. One is based on the horizontal drift, vertical drift. The details don't matter. Um, the dimensions of these detectors, it's roughly 60 meters on one side, 20 meters on the other, 20 meters on the other. And they will be filled with liquid argon. And all of these are countries that work together to build them. We'll install them piece by piece. We'll bring them down because you cannot bring two big pieces uh, through this uh, um, cage. And, and these are other national laboratories that work with us and participate, Brookhaven and Berkeley and Argonne and so on, and many universities. And those detectors have on the outside, they, they are sitting in a so-called cryostat. It's a cryogenic vessel, basically, as you see here, and those uh, the dimensions I mentioned earlier. Those two cryostats are both contributions from CERN to our experiment. And it is the first time the laboratory in Geneva is making contributions to scientific infrastructure outside Europe. The very first time in their history. So um, we work together, we contribute to their experiments, they contribute to ours. So, um, and the fabrication of this has started already. Um, and, and in fact, 
the, the, uh, the first components for the Dune experiment arrived in Leeds, South Dakota, a couple of months ago. It's a beautiful picture. This is the head frame of the mine where you go in order to go underground to reach the Dune covers. And so, and these are the cryostat components going there. The experiment itself, Dune, uh, consists is a big collaboration international that is about 1,400 people from around the world, roughly 35 countries, 50% U.S. institutions, 50% abroad, many students and postdocs. And Fermilab is the host laboratory for the Dune collaboration. And we have already, since about a year ago, started to prepare our laboratory to welcome the Dune collaboration from around the world and do their science. In fact, outside here, there is a control room where scientists can sit and take data from the neutrino oscillations when Dune is online and ready. And, and many other things we do, both scientific, computing, and so on, but also day to day, um, uh, we help the scientists with logistics and, and welcome them to our laboratory to do science with us. Um, and now a couple of words about the accelerator that provides, enables the most intense beam, neutrino beam to LBNF and Dune, but also other research program. Uh, for the laboratory. That's the Proton Improvement Plan. This is an essential upgrade of our accelerator complex. It's an 800 million electron volt proton uh, linear accelerator that, that is uh, housed um, in a tunnel underneath this uh, gallery here. Uh, this is the cryogenic plant building. The construction of this is complete. And now we're in the middle of constructing the rest of the accelerator. This is, as Dylan said, the project I was leading before I became a director, lab director. So um, let me just show you a couple of pictures. The cryoplan building is out there and beautiful. We're building uh, uh, equipment. Um, and uh, a year ago, in fact, uh, we had a nice groundbreaking ceremony with the governor of Illinois, Pritzker, with the undersecretary of the Department of Energy, uh, U Chicago president, uh, Congressman Foster, and so on, many dignitaries to launch the construction of the PIP to LINAC. This is a, a beautiful picture of the Kraupland building, actual photograph. And this is a picture from the construction that is going on right now. It's in full swing. Um, and this LINAC is going to have about 25 so-called cryomodules. Cryomodules are structures that accelerate the proton beam to higher energies. And it has five different types. And we work with international partners to develop them the, do the research and development, and then do prototyping, and then to build them as well. This one is what, the first type, SSR1, and we, we got this done first a, a, a few years ago with a team that built it. And more recently, we completed the so-called high beta 650 cryomodule, and we pushed the state of the art in accelerator technology. It is uh, first of its kind, uh, the, the, the design of this in terms of the accelerating gradient, how fast it can accelerate protons, and how efficiently as well. And when we completed it, we sent it to UK because our UK partners are going to build three out of the four we need of this type. And we want to make sure when they send us the crown modules, when they ship them here, they won't get damaged during transportation. They're very sensitive instruments, of course. Uh, by the way, the length is roughly 10 meters of, of this thing. And it contains six accelerating cavities, three built here, three built in India. So we truly work together as an international team. So to make a transportation test and make sure we know how to transport the crown module Without damaging it, um, we, we, we did this test. We, it, we sent it 
to a UK Darsbury, and then they sent it back here, and that was all done very successfully. And um, our colleagues in the UK uh, celebrate the receipt of it. Um, and so, so PIP2 is really under construction and in full swing. It's going to be completed in 2029, and then we start to um, uh, commission and accelerate the proton beam with the goal to send it on the target to make neutrinos for South Dakota. Second part of our prog program now is the Higgs boson and the study of the Higgs particle. As I mentioned, we do this part of science at CERN in Geneva, where they have the 27 kilometer circumference Large Hadron Collider. It has two main detectors for the study of Higgs. One is the CMS and the other is ATLAS. We, uh, Fermilab is the belongs to the CMS collaboration. And in fact, um, we are the host lab for the US CMS uh, um, contingent, if you like, and this is ab about a thousand people already, scientists that participate in US CMS, and that's roughly one third of the entire CMS collaboration. CERN is our European partner and a very significant, I would say the most significant partner among all. Together, as I said, they focus on the Higgs study, we focus on neutrinos, and we support and, and, and uh, each other's program, and together we push the field forward. Um, we do a science on CMS, and we also are contributing and building components for the upgrade of their accelerator to high luminosity. Both the accelerator, but also the CMS detector needs massive upgrades and we participate in both. Uh, part of the developments we do towards the upgrade of the accelerator for high luminosity is to build the cryoassembly. The cryoassembly is almost like a cryomodule, but instead of including accelerating cavities, it now contains magnets. Two magnets that come around the final focus where the proton beams collide to squeeze them down to very small dimensions in order to increase the luminosity of the machine. So we built this cryo assembly with the two magnets here at Fermilab. We tested it in collaboration with other partners always. We tested it and we shipped it to CERN right before Christmas. And here is uh, CERN celebrating the receipt of our cryo assembly that was the first contribution from the U.S. to the High Lumi LHC project. And, and the, this uh, woman in the middle is Fabiola Gianotti, the director general of CERN, uh, celebrating and being very happy about receiving our contribution. And here that uh, I, I stopped and paused for a minute about all the exchanges that we're having around the world. We're building the, cryo, the cryoassembly. Our um, uh, acting uh, director of the Office of Science here put her signature before it, it was shipped to CERN. Um, we built this cryo module, shipped it to UK. UK will send us three of them to install in PIP2. CERN is sending us Dune components that will be installed in South Dakota. And so this is, there is this exchange of, of, expert, of equipment, but also expertise and knowledge and collaboration that collectively around the world we pu pu pushes the field forward. To me, this is very powerful. Okay, we also do physics with another set of particles, type of particles, that are called muons. Muons are also very interesting. And they also are produced by impeding high power proton beams on targets one of the particles that are produced are muons. It turns out muons have a spin, have spin. So when they are embedded in a magnetic field, the spin precesses their spin around the local magnetic field. And from the rate at which the spin precesses, when we compare that 
with the theoretical model, the standard model of physics, if we see a deviation between experiment and theory, then this could be a signature for new physics. So we remember when I said earlier today about the imprints of quantum phenomena in the universe? Neons help us do exactly that. So by, by using neons and comparing effectively the rate of precession to the theoretical model, we can tell if there is missing physics in the theoretical model. So we have two experiments that do that. One was just completed and we're analyzing the data. The other hasn't started yet. We're still building it. So um, the, the muon G minus two is the one that uh, just completed uh, last, uh, and last August we published the most precise measurement of the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. And uh, you might have heard about that. Uh, two years ago, we, ha we published the first set of analysis where there was indeed a deviation between the theory and the experiment. And recently, uh, we, we published a more precise m measurement yet. That was the 2018. You see, we've narrowed down the error bars. Um, we still have about half of the data to analyze. We'll do that over the next couple of years and then we'll have the definitive story. What is happening between theory and experiment? Is there really signature of new physics? And because it's very exciting, uh, the, the potential um, we made last August, the front page of New York Times with this publication. And, uh, and the other experiment, these are some of the components we're building and it is roughly 90% complete. This is new to electron conversion. This is a very rare process. So we're building an experiment to observe it. Again, if we observe it, it will be a first. Um, and uh, we'll start science in the middle of 2026 on this one. We're really fast tracking it to get to early science. And we also have a program using telescopes on cosmic science. It is not our main thrust, but we bring unique core capabilities, and everybody likes to work with us because of this. Uh, we use telescopes together with partners, other national laboratories, but we also use small laboratory experiments. Some of these are target, target uh, sir, uh, um, investigation of dark matter, both the, the, the discovery, but also the study of dark matter in the laboratory. And we have world-leading expertise in accelerators. And of course, as an accelerator physicist myself, I'm particularly proud of that. Um, we have expertise in accelerator and beam physics itself, the science of accelerators, in superconducting the, the, uh, radio frequency technology and cryogenics. This is technology to accelerate the particle beams. And we say cryogenics because we use niobium that when you cool it down to two degrees Kelvin, just two degrees above absolute zero, it becomes a superconductor. And therefore, uh, there is the electrical resistance goes to zero. Therefore, you can accelerate high, high amount of beam power very efficiently without the need for so much wall plug, wall plug power. To do that, you need massive cryogenic infrastructure, that, uh, like refrigerators that cool the niobium down to two degrees Kelvin. Imagine that. That's why the PIP2, we have a whole building just to house the cryo plant, to give you an idea. So we are some of the world's experts actually, in both the superconducting technology, accelerating technology, and in cryogenics. And high power targetry, uh, I've, I ke kept mentioning that's how we produce neutrinos, muons, everything, and high field magnets, such as the ones who contribute to CERN uh, high luminosity upgrade. And by the way, our capabilities are used not only for high energy physics, 
but for other programs of the Department of Energy. So, for example, Stanford University is building a big X-ray free electron laser, and we're building half of the cryo module for them. And they use our innovations and techno technology innovations for it. Um, and we're very proud of that. And our accelerator complex, the main injector and everything, uh, the, uh, all other accelerators, uh, has achieved almost one megawatt of proton beam power, which is very high and, and it's extraordinary and in, allows us to do a lot of great science. Um, all in all, we're executing a large portfolio of projects, capital construction projects, for the Department of Energy. And we've talked about many of them. This is the whole list. I'm very happy we start to put some check marks. Uh, so to give you first the big picture, over the next decade, what we have on the books right now under execution is $5.6 billion from DOE and more than a billion dollars from international contribution. We have completed 40% of the whole thing, and you can see some of them. The LBNF and UN is 3.3 billion. PIP2 is a billion. This high Lumi uh, LHC upgrade of the detector is 200. The accelerator is about 300 million, and so and the the muon is 300 and so on. Okay, so it's not easy. And, but we are very good at doing that. We're executing methodically all the projects and try safely, first of all, and methodically to complete them in order to enable science as soon as possible. Because at the end of each one of them, there is a scientific price, a scientific output. And, um, and, and I want to point out that the Inflation Reduction Act for a couple of, from a couple of years ago uh, just sent 260 million here that, that help us, helps us with execution of the projects and dealing with uh, some uh, uh, funding uh, issues. Okay, and one of the projects that we have completed is a beautiful building that it's right uh, as you come into the Wilson Hall on the side, that's called the uh, Integrated Engineering Research Center building. That was completed um, with exemplary execution. And two weeks ago, we heard that it received the Department of Energy Excellence Award for project management. So we're very proud of that. And it's a beautiful building. And please note that it, it's as if it has this architectural feature where it's as if you take the Wilson Hall and turn it to its side when, when it's reflected in this reflecting pond in front of it. So it matches, it, it matches the, the Wilson Hall. So we try to preserve this architectural feature, which is another feature of our beautiful campus. So many architectural features all stemming back to the first director, Robert Wilson, who was truly a Renaissance man. Um, and my favorite for the, the girls here in the audience, um, a, a, a year or so ago, our U.S. Senators, Durbin and Duckworth, and Rep oops, sorry, sorry about that, and Representatives Foster and Underwood introduced legislation to rename our EIERC building after Helen Edwards. Helen Edwards was the designer and builder of the Tevatron. The Tevatron was a big collider before we switched to the neutrino program, before the LHC at CERN. We did the energy frontier physics here at Fermilab, and she designed and built that. She was an amazing woman. She was here when I was a graduate student at the helm of the Tevatron at that time. Very inspiring figure. Um, she died in uh, 2016, and and they and w we are going to name the IERC building after her. And just take a minute to read what Senator Tammy Duckworth said. Not only is renaming the IERC after her well deserved, I think it tells generations of girls interested in science 
that they belong at the table. Remember that. So now I'm, I'm almost wrapping up. Um, you to the fact that we need to push technologies in order to bring those experiments online, um, in order to analyze the data, in order to run the accelerators, in order to, to run the detectors, and so on. We are, let's say, almost forced <laughs> to develop the so-called emerging technologies, quantum information science, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and microelectronics. It, it's a force in the sense it is natural for us to just push the state of the art in those technologies. For example, for the Dune experiment, because the detectors are filled with liquid argon, which operates at 87 degrees Kelvin, cryogenic temperatures, we need electronics that operate at these low temperatures. So we had to develop cryogenic electronics and electronics that can withstand high radiation environment because we operate at high beam powers. So this comes naturally in order to do our science. But it turns out that it's very applicable to many other things. For microelectronics in particular, it gives us an edge as a country for the cheap production and manufacturing and to, to make our country competitive around the world in, uh, for, uh, for chips, let's say. Quantum information science. We have problems right now in particle physics that we cannot solve with present day computers. And Dylan, in fact, is doing uh, quantum science and technology for his research. So we are naturally, therefore, um, sort of driven towards developing next generation technologies. And for QIS in particular, because we develop superconducting radiofrequency technology based on the same technology that makes efficient particle accelerators, superconduct superconductivity, also we can use the same technology to make uh, qu quantum qubits uh, with long coherence time. The same property that yields efficient accelerators can yield. Uh, long coherence uh, time and can be used for quantum computers. And so we have, uh, we, we host one of five DOE National Quantum Information Centers, SQMS. There's five of them. We have, we host one of them. And this is based, the research that we do here on quantum is uh, based on superconducting, superconductivity, effectively. So you see how our main mission and pushing those technologies are all intertwined in a very natural way. So our SQMS Center has more than 30 partners, partner institutions, uh, and it is actually a, a, uh, a, it's a center that brings together national laboratories, universities, academia, but also industry. And, and because each one brings a unique perspective into, into this whole enterprise. And, so, and, and also has a couple of uh, uh, partners, UK and Italy, for example, and Canada, uh, international partners as well. So, um, and last summer we had the first high school for a QIS. Uh, hosted here, and uh, last November uh, we had uh, a, another ribbon cutting for uh, the quantum garage, as we call it, where you can see it houses several dilution refrigerators, and it, it is a, a, a national facility, if you like, for scientists and engineers, quantum scientists and engineers, who can bring their qubits or the algorithms to come and test them and do experiments in our quantum garage. This is located in the triangular building I arc that you see if you go out towards 59 from Fermilab. 
So, and uh, we had the ribbon cutting again with Pritzker loves Fermilab, needless to say, <laughs> and uh, Forster and many others. Um, and uh, you guys, the next generation of, of our workforce in STEM field, we take that very seriously and we put a lot of effort into it. And last summer, we had here the highest number of interns in the history of the program at our laboratory. We had 316 kids from universities from all over the country. Some came from California, from everywhere, from South, and of course, many from Illinois. So think about it and apply when you get to college. Um, and this is a, a picture with our uh, bison mascot here. And because we want to, because going in the future, we expect to have a lot more Dune collaborators and users. We have a lot more partners. We have a lot more students coming to Fermilab. Uh, the, the, the need for more housing facility and so on is increased. With the help of University of, of Chicago, uh, the state of Illinois appropriated a year ago $30 million for a new housing facility, and we have renderings already uh, that it's going to, to be, I think, um, we have renderings completed on the road to a little bit away from the village. And, um, and we also, starting with that, I had this vision of uh, coming up with, with the future of our village. How, how do we want our village and our communities to look like 10 years from now? And so anchored on this 30 million housing facility, we're now putting together a 10-year vision for our village um, and for our communities, scientific, STEM, um, tech transfer, partnerships with industry, but also our surrounding communities, like all of you to come and enjoy and educate yourselves. And, and uh, so we all share this amazing uh, uh, place, Fermilab is. So we're in the, in the process of uh, articulating that and we'll have the plan uh, by June. And so I'd like to close here by saying, by just giving you the advice I've always followed. Um, don't worry about planning too much your career and this and the other. Just do what you love to do and with focus, with determination, with passion and with enthusiasm and things will work out. And just be inspired. I've, I've always felt like that. By doing, doing something tangible, um, leaving something that the communities can use to make breakthrough discoveries make a difference in the world we live in for somebody that comes for you and somebody that comes after you as well and above all enjoy what you do and have fun because as i say we came into physics for the love of it so thank you very much Very much, Leah. Any questions from the audience? I'll check Zoom. But uh, any questions? We've got plenty of time. Yes. Get the microphone to you. Oops, excuse me. Um, in the future, could you do time travel with particle accelerators? <laughs> um, not not in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> We're not really doing this. Hey, you're relatively new here. What is the skill set that you have discovered as director that uh, surprised you the most in the year or two you've been here? In, I see. It, for me, you for mean? You in your role, yeah. Yeah, thank you. It, it's a difficult question, very, uh, very insightful. Um, it, it's interesting. I would say, um, I would say, bringing the people along 
with the changes uh, that we I envision, let's say, for our laboratory. Our laboratory has been in existence for 55 years. We have been doing things in a certain way, um, but it, it's also necessary to, to um, A, comply with, what, with the evolving rules from the Department of Energy and from the world around us, for example. Uh, for example, you, you, may, you may know that Fermilab used to be totally open to, for access. Just like when we boarded an aeroplane, it was a lot simpler maybe before uh, September 11th, you know. Um, but now the rules have evolved. So, so bringing people along to understand this evolution and, and, and implement it, um, I think it, it, for an organization of 2,000 people, is tricky. It, it, the other way to say that is the culture of the lab. Uh, it, preserving, I, I guess that's what it is. Uh, our lab has an amazing culture, and, and, and we want to preserve many of, the, of its elements, because this is what got us where we are now. But there are aspects of it that must change for the better of the science, first of all, and of, of the well-being uh, of, of people uh, in our communities. So striking this balance between what to preserve and what to change and bring everybody of the 2,100 people and 4,000 users along, that I find the most challenging, I would say. And it's a skill that I'm still trying to <laughs> develop. I have two questions. Yes. Um, I guess my first question is, maybe three questions. <laughs> like um, you mentioned how neutrinos were, neutrinos were going to be created in this area. And yes. I was wondering how you create neutrinos and if the machine is going to be just as big as the one in South Dakota. Is it going to have the same dimensions? Ah. And then... Um, third question is the uh, logistics of transporting the machines from one country to another. Are they transported through air or yes. water? Good, great questions. Thank you. So I'll start with the second. The cryo modules are transported through air. Uh, we we rented a, a big aeroplane and we loaded the cryo module in, and that's how we shipped it to UK. Now, the cryo assembly went by boat, by the way. And, and so we used different uh, methods, but mostly cryo modules by air, also because of the uh, shape. Now, how we create neutrinos? So we accelerate protons to very high powers, more than a megawatt of proton beam power. And then we have mastered the technology of, of making the so-called high power targets. Those are made of carbon effectively. For June, they are going to be two meters long. So the protons then hit this target, which is carbon, and, and out of the interaction, the nuclear uh, interaction between the protons and the carbon, many particles come out, including neutrinos. And then we have something, some other equipment called horns that direct the neutrinos in a certain direction. And once you direct them in a certain direction, they keep going there, there because they don't interact, but very weakly, they don't deviate from it. So, they, and they end up, uh, in fact, we're going to build a, here on our site a little hill for LBNF in order for the direction of the neutrinos to go downward and end up at the detectors in South Dakota. We've calculated the, the distance. Um, in terms of, uh, so the, 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 in South Dakota, uh, the South Dakota site houses detectors only, not accelerators. Here we have the PIP2 accelerator and also a near site detector as well. And those are housed in different places of our 
side. Is that clear? Very good. Well, you mentioned the neutrinos, right? Right. So once you have them, um, what, what, I mean, what are you going to discover from them? Or what do you think? I mean, I don't know, I guess. Ah, what so. Okay, good, very good question. I, I skipped over a little bit of that. So first of all, uh, I need to say a little bit more. Uh, we, there are neutrinos produced, as I said, by the interaction of the beam with the target, but also anti-neutrinos as well. And so we're going to, all of them will end up in South Dakota. And another important point is neutrinos come in three flavors, uh, not just one. Uh, it's an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. It turns out that it, we, may be, we may produce here an electron neutrino, but by the time it traverses, it ends up in South Dakota, it may turn into a tau or a muon neutrino. And this property, which is very strange, is called neutrino oscillation. In other words, it's a quantum phenomenon that these three neutrino types um, are in a superposition with each other. So it, there is a, a probability to have a, a, a tau neutrino or an electron or a mu neutrino at the same time. So the how neutrinos oscillate, uh, we measure here, let's say, the electron neutrinos, the flux generated, and then track them, and when they arrive, we measure what they turn into. From this oscillation, we correlate that with, we, we compare this, by the way, the fraction, the conversion, if you like, between neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. If we see a difference, then that will tell us about the matter and antimatter asymmetry in the universe. So that's what we're measuring. We're measuring how neutrinos and antineutrinos oscillate, the, the, this property. I'm simplifying it, of course, very much. And we correlate that to matter antimatter asymmetry. Question from Zoom. So uh, what are some of the biggest challenges facility directors face these days? Mm. <laughs> a facility is in a Fermilab for it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Excellent questions. Where do I start? <laughs> um, okay. Um, um, well, I, I think I, I would say funding uh, is is always uh, I, not not really a challenge. In some cases, it's a challenge. Um, I would say it is a challenge. A and and here is the here is uh, our situation. Whereas we have very healthy funding uh, for our projects, and the LBNF and UN and PIP too. This entire neutrino program is very well supported. By the way. Uh, by our uh, congressional representatives and so on. In fact, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow for Washington to, uh, to do visits on the Hill, to meet Durban, to meet uh, Duckworth, to meet uh, yeah. the, the South Dakota senators as well, uh, and advocate for our program and tell them all the good stuff we're doing and, and advocate. And we do that in coordination with the Department of Energy in order to keep investing into the science that we do here. But nevertheless, so, so our project uh, portfolio is very well funded. But because the Office of Science total top line budget uh, it, it, it is, is maybe sometimes more limited than what we need it to be, we may end up having issues on the research and operation side here. And so, and that's the situation we're facing now. Um, so we, we, uh, we had to 
curtail the operation of the accelerator complex uh, to, no, uh, to, to less than a full year uh, due to, to some extent, uh, some limitation in funding. So th this, um, so this is one, I, I would say, challenge that we always need to stay on top and 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 work proactively. Uh, we, in order to support all our ambitions, I would say. Um, other challenges, as I mentioned earlier, is that I guess. Um, the, the whole geopolitical situation in the world, and there is competition, and, and there is, of course, cooperation, and the situation with some countries that are not friends of our country, and, and how we navigate um, the, the, the politics, let's say, uh, uh, Russia or China, and, and so on. And of course, there are interrelationships among the scientists, but there are, there are also uh, at the laboratory level or at the Department of Energy level. Uh, so those are always tricky to navigate because we want to preserve the scientist to scientist collaboration. Uh, science is supposed to be open, is supposed to have no boundaries, to have no boundaries. But, but we cannot be naive about it. Or some of the technologies, uh, the quantum, for example, so there are multiple, quantum microelectronics. Um, we must be smart when we develop those technologies so as not to make them available to adversaries of our country. Um, and, and at the same time, we want to encourage collaboration and openness. So I, I would say those are more at the high level uh, challenges that we face. Great, thank you. Got some more questions, great. Thank you, uh, hi. Hi. So like with all like the money that like Fermilab and like we're receiving to put into projects like Dune, like what do we hope to get out of it like 10, 15 years down the line, like beyond just like more okay. discovery and like knowledge of like the particles? Yeah, I think, to rewrite the books of physics is, and, and maybe get a couple of Nobel Prizes along the way, is <laughs> that we're hoping to achieve. <laughs> that's, that's really why we're here. That is the fundamental reason, and by itself makes it all worth it, um, because, because it contributes to our understanding of the universe. As I mentioned, though, as a secondary uh, outcome, of course, is all these developments in quantum, in microelectronics, in machine learning, as, as we push uh, the, the state of the art. I, I'll give you an example. Last week, we signed an agreement with the startup x uh, to contribute to the development of an accelerator technology because of our expertise in superconducting RF that they'll use for uh, uh, chip manufacturing at 1,400 nanometers uh, wafers and so on. And this is $4 million that they're giving us uh, to contribute to the development. They're, it's a startup. They, they plan to build a prototype and then to build hundreds of these machines um, around the country for, for production of chips. And of course, if, if, it, if, if, if the plan goes uh, as they hope, uh, will play a big role in it. And so the, there are technology transfer aspects that uh, that go along with what we do. Thank you. Yeah. So you talked about, is this like close enough? Uh, the right. what, sorry? Uh, so you talked about um, wanting to discover like more about the Higgs boson uh, proving dark energy and matter. Um, I know you talked about like the plan for neutrinos and what you're going to do about that. Have you developed a plan yet for what you're going to do about either of those three? Ah, like excellent question as well. So for for dark energy, uh, let me start there. The community has decided that there is an, a, a new project called the Cosmic Microwave Background Stage 4 
that is going to install hundreds of telescopes in Chile and in Antarctica, in the South Pole. Uh, and we're part of this. We play a small role. That project is really hosted by Berkeley Lab. And so that is the next generation dark energy um, uh, pro major project. The, and, and Fermilab plays a role in it uh, with our unique capabilities. So we don't have our own program that we lead for dark energy. For dark matter, this is very intriguing and something I, I love to, to think about. So it turns out we have no idea where, what the mass range of dark matter is. There are roughly 80 orders of magnitude <coughs> over which we're searching around the world as a community for dark matter. It could be anywhere. 80 orders of ma magnitude is huge. So ma my dream, in fact, and I know it's a little bit crazy, is that through our own experiments and through collaborating with others, we participate in this entire range of, of mass range in searches so that and wherever it is, we'll be there to find it. Part of what we do is we have small scale experiments, in fact, some using quantum technologies to detect dark matter in certain energy regimes. Um, we have some superconducting cavities, in fact, that, we, that are used for detection or setting limits in dark matter energies. And we have... Um, magnets and different types of uh, lab scale experiments that we do here for the dark matter detection. And of course, as I said, we collaborate with other labs on other mechanisms as well. Thank you. Yes. In fact, we, we plan, sorry, next week we have a workshop that's called Dark Wave Lab. That's a new thing. And so we want to install, we're getting a magnet from UIUC, an MRI magnet. It's 9.4 Tesla. And uh, we're going to get it here later this year. We'll install it in our dark wave lab and we'll use, put detectors in it. And again, the community can bring their own detectors and put them in that 9.4 Tesla magnet to, to do dark matter detections. Exciting. Hi. Hi. You um, mentioned mainly government funding. Do you get funding from other sources like research institutes or, or private funding? And also, have you ever seen a waiver in funding as far as, um, you know, ups and downs over the decades and what causes that? Uh, so we have a little bit of funding from other sources. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, from other programs of the Office of Science, other than high energy physics. Uh, for example, Basic Energy Sciences funds the X-ray laser at Stanford, and they sent us 40, 50 million to build cryo modules. We also have um, uh, funding from tech transfer activities. Uh, the, the one with x light I mentioned, the 4 million, is an example of that from the private sector. Uh, we get some funding from NNSA to do, to do tech transfer development and from um, um, DOD a little bit, uh, different sources. Um, so, but, but the predominant source, by the way, this is also one of the, uh, the things that strategically I want us to pursue as a lab, as a lab to increase uh, the amount of funding that comes from non-HGP sources, without, of course, hurting our main program. Uh, but uh, so uh, uh, more recently, we're going after Department of Commerce. Uh, we would like very much because of the CHIPS Act and so on. There may be some possibilities there. And because of our core capabilities in microelectronics. So uh, we'd, we'd love that. Um, uh, whether now the second part of your question, there has been ups and downs uh, in the funding. Um, what, it, it depends on the priorities of the administration, or to some extent, of course. It depends. Uh, so some administrations, uh, right now, um, uh, issues of climate 
and and so on are are very uh, of, of very high priority or uh, energy efficiency etc uh, so so there, there are fluctuations and we have to 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 just navigate the whole thing in a way that maintains resilience to our program and we keep making progress and push forward it's not always easy all right last question <laughs> what are some of the possible implications of the discovery of dark matter and dark energy Anti -energy. oh my god i don't know <laughs> Dylan, what do you think? <laughs> well, I think that the uh, technologies that we develop, as uh, Leah had mentioned, the technologies that we develop to build the um, sensitive detectors that we need to actually look for dark matter mm -hmm. are That's translatable uh, into the public sector. So, um, uh, Thank you. That's a great point. So, for instance, one of my projects that I work on is developing qubits to look for dark matter. And so yeah. to develop a sufficiently sensitive qubit for dark matter means you've also developed a good qubit for quantum computing. And so quantum computing yeah. is, you know, the, the, the future of computing. This is a very hot topic um, broadly across the world. Um, so while dark matter itself, like the detection of dark matter, may not be anything more than an um, academic exercise, technologies that we develop to get us to that point will translate into um, public sector. Great Good answer. Question. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, so when we were talking about the 80 orders of magnitude in mass range for dark matter, some of it falls under the quantum regime, and you need quantum sensors in order to detect them. And as Dylan very nicely said, there is a lot of synergy between developing quantum sensors and quantum computers for dark matter and QIS. So, excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Hey. All right. Let's thank Director Mermigo one more time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, so again, congratulations students. This is an amazing, uh, amazing step for all of you. Um, we had 90 students that participated throughout this, uh, this, this semester. 67, 67 of those students uh, earned a certificate of accomplishment and 35 of those students also achieved per perfect attendance. So thank you for making this class a success. Um, I really enjoyed working with, uh, with the team to set this up and really enjoyed having all of you as students. Um, so let's get uh, going. So is this the first slide? Okay, great. So, Adita Biju. No. Yes, yeah, so uh, Aditya, congratulations for perfect attendance. Did we did we skip? You skipped the slide. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. We skipped the slide. But uh, continue. Thank you. No problem. This is. We, uh, sorry. The last name was. There you go. And then we'll start from here. Thank you for bearing with us. No, no worries. All right, uh, Alishba Amir. I was awarded a certificate of accomplishment. Advit Aurora for also a certificate of accomplishment.
Hamza Asif was awarded a certificate of accomplishment. Daniel Banda, congratulations on perfect attendance. Moksha Batla, certificate of accomplishment. Congratulations. Pranit Bhuvan, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Michael Bork, perfect attendance. Congratulations also. <laughs> Mayhawk Chandran, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Jack Clinton, Certificate of Accomplishment. Kasra Dashpema, Perfect Attendance. Mateo De Luna, Perfect Attendance, congratulations. John Dalawal, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Cameron Eddington, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Mira Evans, certificate of accomplishment. Natanya Ezimako, Certificate of Accomplishment. <laughs> Rohan George, Perfect Attendance, congratulations. <laughs> Noah Gluckman, Certificate of Accomplishment. <laughs> Pranav Goel, Perfect Attendance, congratulations. Ishvani Gupta, Certificate of Accomplishment. Congratulations. <laughs> Emily Hernandez, Certificate of Accomplishment. Caitlin Hu, perfect attendance, congratulations. <laughs> Isabel Ivkovitz, perfect attendance, also congratulations. Victor Jimenez, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Jasmitha Kokanti, perfect attendance, congratulations.
I'm sorry. Can we go back to the slide? Oh, I'm, my, my mistake. Julia Henrich, Certificate of Accomplishment. I apologize. Thank you. Congratulations. Dia Conduit, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Congratulations. Charvi Kumar, for Certificate of Accomplishment. Roman Lehanoff, Certificate of Accomplishment. Wow, I'm bad at this. Well, come up and we'll go back. Thank you. This is Romaine. Sophia Leifer, Certificate of Accomplishment, my apologies. Ali Liang, perfect attendance, congratulations. Leah Liu, Certificate of Accomplishment. Thomas Madsen, perfect attendance, congratulations. Aryan Monsing, Certificate of Accomplishment. Cassandra Eve Marvitz, Certificate of Accomplishment. Tyler Matheson, perfect attendance, congratulations. Jamie McKernan, perfect attendance, congratulations. Bobby Meinig, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Arya Mishra, certificate of accomplishment. Taylor Muehlhauser, Certificate of Accomplishment. Ayana Mukherjee, Certificate of Accomplishment.
Laksh Munat, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Uh, Sami Nakan Muradova, perfect attendance. Monish Morali, Certificate of Accomplishment. Dai Nandela, Certificate of Accomplishment. Dai Kamalaksha, Nimisha, Nimisha Kavi, Perfect Attendance. Congratulations, I apologize. Siddharth Nitur, perfect attendance, congratulations. John Ogan, perfect attendance, congratulations. Elizabeth Pantiru, perfect attendance, congratulations. Gavin Park, Certificate of Accomplishment. Prina Patel, Perfect Attendance, congratulations. Arnav Pillay, Perfect Attendance, congratulations. Natan Prisbilko, Certificate of Accomplishment. Divya Ram, Certificate of Accomplishment. Ricardo Ramirez, Perfect Attendance, congratulations. Valeria Ramirez, perfect attendance. Congratulations. <laughs> Raina Robinson, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Daria Sadat, perfect attendance, congratulations. Arabella Simmons, certificate of accomplishment. Ryan Sims, certificate of accomplishment. Colin Sloman, Certificate of Accomplishment.
Henry Snyder, perfect attendance. Congratulations. Besides Soto, Certificate of Accomplishment. <laughs> Jessica Thunberg, Certificate of Accomplishment. Charlene Vasquez, Certificate of Accomplishment. <laughs> Srimeda Viratu, Perfect Attendance, congratulations. And Jessica White, Certificate of Accomplishment. Congratulations to you all. This was a great season of, uh, or uh, semester, rather, of Saturday Morning Physics. Thank you uh, to everyone else involved with Saturday Morning Physics. Thank you, Leah, for being here today. Um, and all the best for all of you uh, in the rest of your career and your academic you know, uh, journey. Um, so, this is going to conclude today's event, um, unless you'd like to add any final words. Absolutely. Let's thank all the graduates again and their families. So um, I invite you to the second floor here is open to the public. We have an art gallery there. If you haven't seen it, feel free to stick around and check it out, um, as well as the Letterman Science Center, which is right down the road. I believe that's open today. Um, so that has some interactive exhibits and demonstrations and things. So feel free to check that out as well. And the gift shop, importantly. So thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Have a good weekend.